All right, boys, welcome back. Um, we are officially in the ashes and cinders of an election that surprised most of us. Um, those of you who weren't surprised, congratulations, you're rich. Uh, those of you who weren't surprised but uh, lost the courage of your conv convictions and sold all of your Dem shares, um, we've been there too. So if you need a shoulder to cry on, uh, come join us here at Star Spangled Gamblers. Prateek, um, my vision for how we're going to do today's podcast is um, obviously, we need to close out the election. There's still some markets trading, and they, of course, connect to um, important and viable stories in the national dialogue. How did that sound? That sounded like something from the Washington Post. So I think we need to talk about the kind of last little breadcrumb trails of this election. Um, I think we also need to talk a little bit about um, FTX's crypto collapse, because that seems to have more to do with um, political betting and probably um, the near-term agenda out of Washington um, than maybe people expect right now. And um, then I've got a little stupid game for us to play uh, called uh, New, New Dark Age or Born Again. And um, we'll just read the tea leaves from this election and make some predictions for the next, next season of politics. Um, finally, I want to end this podcast by um, calling out some people who have been awesome for political gambling as we sort of end what might be the last a uh, huge election cycle for a while in legal betting. So um, was that too much prelude? Are you okay to uh, get on this little gondola and ride through the forest with me? Yeah, sounds good. Um, okay, all right. So uh, don't want to dwell too much on the obvious. So uh, we had an election on Tuesday. And in case any of you have been in opium dens and uh, unconscious for the last week, we did in fact have an election on Tuesday. It did not go the way people thought it would. Uh, Democrats performed quite well. Um, polls proved themselves to be useful for the first time in a while. Um, I think as, what, what are we calling it? We're basically calling the House for Republicans, even though it hasn't happened yet, but it looks like the Democrats will control the Senate. Um, does that get us through the top line? Did I miss any well, big to stories? Be, so to, to be clear, um, I mean, as of this recording, both the House and Senate are not quite settled. Um, so in terms of the Senate side, it's certainly looking uh, like the Democrats are in good shape. But um, as of now, Arizona, Nevada, and then, of course, Georgia, which is going to run off, uh, are not called. Um, again, I my view is that Arizona is more or less in the bag if you can uh, get the uh, Democrats there in the low 90s. Uh, that's certainly a bargain. Uh, Ralston and others are saying that Cortez Masto looks to be in good shape in Nevada, but that that one is not quite done yet. Um, uh, right now, that's trading sort of around 85, 15 for the Democrats. But interestingly, the House, um, there's a lot of side betting happening in our community. But um, to give some benchmark, I mean, right now, uh, if you go on predict it, the, um, the markets are saying, you know, roughly like 85-5. Yeah, 85-5 the, for the Republicans. But like Logan Phillips, um, who has been one of the more accurate uh, forecasters this cycle, is putting it at 80% that the Republicans win the House. So by no means a, a done deal yet. Um, right, right. So uh, we talked a lot on this podcast about the mi mixed messages before the election. Um, certainly still mixed messages reverberating. Um, maybe we should uh, briefly grade ourselves on our forecasting prowess. Uh, shout out Logan Phillips, by the way, for a great election. Um, I'm going to give us like a B to a B minus on this election. Do you think, um, do you think that's fair? Uh, well, it depends who, who the us is. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say Star Spangled Gambler is our community writ large, uh, all the different guests we had on and so forth. Um, I think we were kind of all over the map. Um, you know, I think the the people who fared relatively won, uh, re relatively well were people who, uh, well, I was I would say Logan Phillips, uh, who came on our show, I think was certainly ahead of the curve in in seeing that a lot of the red wave commentary was overstated. Uh, Zubby Badger, I would also definitively put in that category. He was really sounding the alarm uh, shortly before election night, but we also had some pretty uh, uh, wild red wave uh, people on the show. I think Zoltar certainly has a lot to answer for. Um, I'm sure we'll have him on. Yeah. Um, so I think we were, I think, look, I think we we kind of did what our mandate is, which is to capture the spectrum of opinion. And yeah. I think we succeeded in that respect. 
Yeah, if you were on our last podcast, I think personally my closing projection was 51 uh, seats for the Republicans, which, you know, there could still be some apocalyptic scenario, uh, scenario where that happens, but um, we can pretty well rule it out. Um, well, given, given where the markets were on the eve of the election, I mean, if you had made that bet 51, there was ample time to flip that one on election day and get a good return. I, I hope you did that and um, uh, and predicted servers did. Uh, maybe the biggest surprise of the election actually held up pretty well. So yeah. election night trading generally was uh, yeah. doable. So I think for the purposes of where we are now, um, there's kind of two bets that are still on the table. The um, first is Carrie Lake, um, the creepy MAGA TV star in Arizona. Uh, that election has been swinging in like the 50 to 60 range. So if you think you can get an edge there, uh, get ready to live in that space for some time to come. Uh, I would actually just suggest that people do what um, Kelvin, uh, who is one of the best shit posters, uh, especially, you know, shit posters on our accounts. Uh, uh, he, he seems to have a pretty good idea what's going on in Arizona. So I would just follow him. But um, I get a little stressed out in these swingy post election markets. Uh, and then the second is just, uh, I think, Kevin McCarthy, you brought this one to my attention, trading at a huge discount to be the next Speaker of the House. Uh, certainly some worries that maybe he's lost his mandate with House Republicans. But I think if you dig into the kind of gossip lore in Washington, there's not a lot to back that up. Um, are you seeing it that way? So uh, we, we had a number of mailbag on this. I think the Kevin McCarthy issue is worth getting into. Um, I mean, can, look, I think the first... Can, uh, can you remind people who Kevin McCarthy is? I don't think I, I did a good job of that. Yeah, so basically there's a market on predicted who will be the next speaker in Congress. And basically it has the whole slate of possible people, both on the Democratic and Republican side. So Kevin McCarthy is currently the uh, Republican leader. Um, and there's sort of a conventional wisdom that he is the front runner if the Republicans take Congress. So part of the reason why... Um, McCarthy's price is depressed right now. It's at 68% is because there's an open question whether or not Republicans are even going to, in fact, um, uh, win the win the House. But um, even if they do, I think what the markets are factoring in is that there's no guarantee that McCarthy will be able to consolidate support uh, among Republicans. And we can get into why uh, later, but that that's the reason why the markets are where they are. So, so the issue, um, I'll, I'll just get right into it. So the reason why I think that that's a buy at 68 cents and is that, um, who, like, who's going to run against Kevin McCarthy, you know, like Steve Scalise. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So there, there, I think there are two questions here that we have to tackle. So the first is why is there any doubt, uh, with McCarthy? Um, I received a good mailbag comment uh, on this from uh, Boris. Maybe I can just read that and then yeah, 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 yeah. It. Let's hit that mailbag. Slap that. Okay, bag. so all right. So he's saying this is message from Boris. He's saying, okay, thoughts on betting no on Kevin McCarthy to to be speaker? Question mark. So then he basically has a bunch of bulleted items uh, on why McCarthy might be in trouble. So I'll just read these through. So. Number one, Matt Gates and company are already coming out strong against him. Number two, he had that leaked recording where he defended Liz Cheney, so expect Trump to come out against him. Number three, it's accepted as fact in Beltway circles that he had an affair with Brene Elmers. This is a former Tea Party sure. member of Congress, which is why Paul Ryan got speaker instead of McCarthy. People threatened to release the evidence. That's still out there. Uh, number four, Steve Scalise has broad support. And number five, a Republican majority will be slim. So the Freedom Caucus has a lot of bargaining power. Um, I, I mean, like, interesting and all good points. But I mean, I'll point towards Politico playbook sedition today where they say, quote, there is no alternative. The number two leader, Steve Scalise, declared his candidacy for majority leader and publicly disclaimed any interest in challenging McCarthy. By the way, I don't know how many people want McCarthy's job. His job's going to be the worst thing ever. It's going to be like trying to manage like a Subway restaurant that is only has like lazy hungover college kids in it. No one is going to want to keep a lid on the dumpster that's going to be the GOP conference, this conference. So um, I, like wh who the question is, who are people going to vote for? If not McCarthy, I would say no one. So I, I think it's a safe bet. 
So were you on the Hill back when this McCarthy thing happened the last time around? No, no, I wasn't on the Hill back then. Uh, that was right around the time I left. But I was on the Hill when John Boehner was the Speaker of the House. And that was like, literally, I couldn't imagine a more miserable job than um, than what Boehner was doing. And it'll be so much worse for McCarthy with such a thin majority uh, come next year. So yeah, I was actually on the Huckabee campaign back when this McCarthy thing happened. And it came as a shock when he didn't become Speaker that time around. But what, one question I had for you is I remember at that time, there were these affair allegations. But is it in fact the case that that's why McCarthy stepped aside? Because I saw that, I think it was Politico or somewhere else reporting recently on this, and they seem to say part of the issue last time around was the same deal, that McCarthy wasn't able to strike a deal with the Freedom Caucus, and that it was not in fact the affair thing. But I, I never quite figured out you know, what the you know, reason was. I'll be completely honest and say this was like peak keen dog in Hollywood stage. Like I was probably strung out on Santa Monica Boulevard with like a vape and a bottle of fireball or something at this point in time. Um, but I, I just think that the House Republican Conference, I mean, if you go back in time to it was like 2015, I think late 2015, basically the Freedom Caucus or RSC or whatever it was at the time, it just publicly beheaded John Boehner. It was like the episode of Game of Thrones where Ned Stark just, you know. Um, and I don't think like a lot of people wanted that job after that. Like, you know, they had run John Boehner ragged, thrown him out without even a thank you. And, uh, I just got the idea that Paul Ryan was the only person who was willing to do the job that could get some semblance of buy-in from the party. Yeah. I mean, look, I, so to be transparent about this, I mean, I have, uh, basically maxed out on McCarthy. Yes. I thought I was getting a good deal in the seventies. It's now trading at, uh, at 68%. I, I just think like, okay, I mean, if we look at these different things, I, I think, first of all, McCarthy clearly wants the job, which is actually makes him a surprisingly unique figure in Congress right now. And, um, you know, he's just sort of showed a track record of um, being very valuable. So even if you're looking at the challenge from the right, maybe they'll come up with another candidate to run against him. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think the Freedom Caucus and other kind of right wing uh, members of Congress are likely to get about the best deal out of McCarthy that they, they can get from anyone. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, okay, let's say there was an affair, which hasn't really been substantiated. I mean, I think the Republican Party has just gone so far beyond holding people accountable for personal scandals. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. of all of all people, I don't think this is the time and place that's going to get litigated. Okay, but can we ask another question? So um, is Nancy Pelosi coming back? Because I'm well, going to say Hakeem Jeffries. Yeah, so I, I was going to say, I mean, okay, first of all, if you took our advice before the election to hedge with a Hakeem Jeffries, a lot and of a that one, Scalise. that was that was like the pick of the election for for you, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I picked up uh, some Scalise at two percent. I I unfortunately didn't hold it as long as I should have, but yeah, that was a good pick. But yeah, the Hakeem Jeffries also paid if you flipped it. But yeah, I I think right now if you're looking at the uh, where to park money on predict it, um, I think I would argue, you know, maybe I would say number one would probably be continue to take mega money in the Arizona Senate, but number two is I think. Um, short Pelosi right now trading at eight percent to be speaker I mean even if even if you think Democrats are taking the house which I don't think they are I mean Pelosi has made it pretty clear this is her last time she's going to be speaker I know there's going to be people calling for her to go give it another run um but between those two factors I I just don't see it I think you're I think that's a pretty safe bet to take Pelosi yeah, yeah. in the low 90s yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty heavy on Kevin McCarthy, and then I've got some Hakeem Jeffries, you know, just in case this election uh, comes in in a in a yeah, weird but, uh, and, dramatic and, way. And by the way, yeah, and, and and speaking of bonds, I mean, I would say the other two I, I would definitely say is right now the combination of Elise Stefanik and Jim Jordan to be speaker is trading at 12%. I think both of those are more or less non-starters, uh, so yeah. I, would, I would max those as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's your um, your last little morsel of genius on this election. Uh, should we talk briefly about um, FTX, the uh, giant uh, Sam Bankman-Fried crypto exchange that 
uh, evaporated something like $15 billion of people's money this past week. Because I think FTX's back end is, um, if you were reading the Kalshi tweets, uh, e even caught them up in it because they were clearing trades through one of their exchanges or something. Or am I, am I getting this right? Yeah, well, so before we get to uh, Bankman Free, there is one more uh, piece of business from the last uh, election. The other market that is still live is uh, Nevada Governor. Um, yeah. Right now, that one's trading about. It's, it's called 10. Nevada. You gotta be polite. Yeah, Nevada. Nevada. Uh, yeah, Say it with me. Thank you. Nevada. Nevada. Okay. Nice. Um, that one again. I would follow Ralston, but there's every indication that uh, uh, Lombardo, the Republican candidate, is in much better shape than uh, Laxalt on the Senate side. Um, uh -huh. So I think that's also a place to park money on the Republicans. But yeah, I mean, um, in terms of F FTX, so I haven't followed the really deep weeds and the details of this but, but um this one's pretty important for for the political gambling community in a number of ways um i guess we can get into the betting lines on this and there are quite a few uh but before we do i, I don't know if people know this but um sam bankman fried is actually a pretty big enthusiast of political prediction markets and through his different charities and philanthropic causes has actually put quite a bit of money to try to get these markets uh in a better place um so certainly disappointing uh in that respect um also very disappointing for yeah. political grifters because my understanding was is that bankman sbf was just just dumping money on like anyone who would take it in washington this election cycle too yeah so i mean there's well okay so that that's a good transition to the markets i mean right now in poly market will sam bankman freed be federally indicted end of the year um right now it's an 80 20 market with yes trading at 20 percent. and then i also saw i think domer and a couple others are making side bets on whether or not um bankman freed will actually be on the run um on the run being defied as actually leaving the country uh to escape uh, uh legal uh you know legal sanctions in fact let me um yeah, uh, there's actually a market. Also, if you want to trade this on Insight Prediction, uh, will Sam Bankman Freed be on the run? Uh, that one's trading at 8% right now. Um, I have some thoughts on that, but do you want to get into that? Well, okay. First of all, I want to say something clearly because we do respect the people who we're in business with. Um, I want to say clearly that Kalshi is fine. I said that there was a quote on Kalshi about them being sucked up on this the exact quote from Tarek was uh your funds are safely held in a segregated member account uh through ledger x llc so uh if there was any doubt uh cal she's fine just uh just drawing attention to the fact that um this random crypto exchange touches quite a bit more than uh, traders might have thought now as for sam bankman freed um i don't really understand the full story like basically he was just really sloppy with how he managed this giant exchange and his sloppiness caused it to crater is that is that the official story like i don't want to get too in the weeds but do i have that right i i i also need to kind of read up on it and this is all a bit outside of my area of expertise but i think that he was basically tra taking user funds and putting it and like investing it or something yeah um, well it sounds like we probably shouldn't talk that much about this if yeah. either of us know what the fuck we're talking about yeah. Uh, well, well, anyway, I, so, uh, yeah, I guess the point I'm making is, you know, I don't think anyone quite knows what happened. And between just all the market panic, all the news stories, the fact that, I, you know, traders on a place like Poly Market and Insight are probably crypto bros who are deep in the weeds of this. Um, and just the fact that Sam Bankman-Fried is by far one of the biggest Democratic donors in the country, uh, also one of the younger ones who's clearly held out uh, the possibility of bank rolling them even more uh, right right until i really want to keep clear milking that cow yeah until i see really clear evidence that um there was something clearly illegal in what he did uh i'm gonna say that this probably isn't the one merrick garland wants to touch i think at most we're probably looking at an sec fine civil enforcement or something so i would say uh well, yeah, take the, the, note but... on all these uh, legal markets I mean, what this really augurs is that like Congress is going to do a bill to regulate cryptocurrency. This is this is the thing that makes it salient. So, um, if and when this this feels like a Kalshi bet, like a you know, will 
uh, the such and such to regulate crypto act pass or something like that. When they post that line, I think that that should be a heavy favorite going in. It's like every Congress needs something to do. All of these congressmen and regulators want to have plush exit options to go work in the you know lobbying groups for these deep pocketed crypto bros. So I, I think that's a lock whenever that that happens. Yeah. Well, I will say too that so I I agree with you that I think this FTX thing certainly adds um, urgency to getting a crypto bill through Congress, and maybe that could be good news for us in the sense that there might be opportunity to get language in there. Um, Yes. Clarifying uh, what to do with event contracts and political prediction markets is a long shot. But um, if it's going to happen, that may be the, the occasion. So it's something we can talk about further. OK. All right. So I'm going to make a declaration at this point in the po podcast. Are you ready for it? Yeah. We're not going to talk about FTX anymore. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay. Okay. So um, let's play a game. This is going to be a wide ranging game, Pratik. Um, and we're just going to go through some of the lessons and anti lessons that we just learned in this election. And um, we'll come back to it later when we have an excuse to bet on them. But um, I want to nominate some stories for um, new dark age. That would be, you know, things that aren't going quite so well, didn't prove quite so true. Uh, and uh, born again, which would be uh, kind of watch this space, things to expect more from uh, between now and whenever the future comes. So, uh, you're welcome to nominate some too, but, um, maybe I can get us started. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So I'm going to say, I'm actually going to deem this a new dark age for alpha males based on the election returns. What do you think? Uh, say more. Well, I, I mean, if you look at who succeeded and who failed, like you have J.D. Vance and Mark Kelly, who I think we can all agree are beta males rolling through their elections and um, Dr. Oz and Tim Ryan, uh, you know, just getting crushed. Blake Masters getting smoked like uh, those to me are three clear alpha males. I also count uh, uh, John Fatterman as a beta male too. you know, living off his parents, never really having a job. Um, so I think beta males really rolled this election. I think alpha males uh, really had a lot of liabilities with voters. Voters just rejected alpha males, just negged them. So I think it's a new dark age for alpha males in America. Um, I guess, uh, but, you know, speaking like to the murkiness of this election, I would say if there's one totally unambiguous winner, it's uh, Ron DeSantis, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know where he falls in your alpha beta. He is. He yeah, no, no, he he's um he he's um a sigma male, is what he is. Well, um, Trump certainly disagrees on that. Boy, that was the most entertaining thing I've ever read in my life. Uh, um, um, do you want to take Trump? I feel yeah. like he deserves to be nominated for something. So, okay, look. I, I think as I've made clear on these podcasts, I mean, I've been shorting Trump for a long time and I've I've paid for that in the sense that I just have to wait patiently for these prices to move. But I have been quite surprised, I mean, how much people have been rushing to declare Trump dead after this. Um, I mean, let's just be clear. This is a guy who, after his 2016 election, basically got none of his agenda through during his presidency, lost both houses of Congress, lost his re-election, and, uh, by the way, got impeached twice, including uh, via an insurrection on the Capitol, and now is, like, right on the cusp of getting indicted. And none of that convinced Republicans to ditch the guy, so, like, a couple of bad Senate elections now are going to be the thing that causes his downfall. So, so are you are you nominating Trump for a uh, born-again ribbon? Are you going to call him born again? Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is my analysis has not changed fundamentally, which is that I do think that Trump's going to, uh, you know, this Trump thing's going to pass. But I, I, I think that my view continues to be that the thing that's going to sink him is his legal woes, much more so than this midterm election. And I know that's not as fun to talk about. But I mean, the same day that everyone's talking about, uh, you know, the, the impact that John Fetterman might have on Trump's political future way less people were talking about the court proceedings in Manhattan, uh, where Alan Weiss uh, Weisselberg was throwing him under the bus for tax fraud. I mean, I think that line of stories uh, is much more likely to do Trump than uh, election blowback. Bro, I'm just trying to play a stupid game. Um, 
I'm going to nominate Trump for Born Again, even if I'm the only one who will play my game. I'm going to nominate Trump for Born Again because what is Trump without a little bit of controversy? He's back in the news. People are talking about him. This is right where he likes to be. Uh, whether or not he's going to be the Republican Party's nominee, uh, we'll let history play out. But I don't think this is a new dark age for Donald Trump. I think this is just more of the same. So uh, that is my official nomination. Well, um, I guess to close that out, I would take the in that game, I would take the other side. I think this is a dark age for Trump. I guess my point is that things were never all that bright in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to nominate um cockservitism uh i know that both of us at certain times in our lives have identified as cockservatives uh i'm gonna say that cockservitism is born again what do you think um why don't you define that first well i think the most important parts about being a cockservative are reading the wall street journal um, secretly liking Tucker Carlson, but not admitting to any of your friends or spouses or family members because you're afraid that you won't be invited to the tennis game. Um, I think it's unironically liking Dan Quayle as part of being a conservative. I think it's, um, you know, just wondering how much better history would have been if John McCain had won the nomination in 2000 instead of George W. Bush. I think these are the, the, the real facets of conservatism. Maybe having been a National Journal subscriber, um, maybe being proud to drink your coffee black. These are all traits of conservatives. Um, and I think that after Trump getting or trump's candidates at least just getting absolutely spanked uh you know it's emboldened people who um, have brooks brothers suits read the wall street journal uh to reassert themselves in republican politics uh maybe gives someone like nikki haley like more than a zero percent chance of being the nominee uh in 2024 um uh you know just makes these people feel relevant again uh, whether or not they are, we can talk about in future episodes, but I am nominating conservatives for being uh, born again on this day, 2022. So look, I, I know like the smart thing to do from a political pundit standpoint is like make a bunch of bold claims and uh, weave a narrative. But uh, again, I just, I think this election has been very murky and it's hard to say who's going to come out ahead. I mean, everyone's saying that this is a disappointment for Trump uh, and that wing of the party, but I mean, let's. I think that the disappointment has more to do with the fact that expectations were set so high than what the actual outcome was. I mean, let's face it, Trump basically injected himself in Republican primaries. He more or less got the nominees he wanted. Now, some of them underperformed. But, um, you know, now you're going to have a, a sitting senator like J.D. Vance, uh, Kari Lake, very much in the running to be uh, governor and uh you know and then in terms of the other side of the spectrum i mean the conservatives as you say whether or not they're making a comeback i kind of think they blew it too i mean uh you know rick scott and others were trying to convince uh the republican party to go actually campaign on a message instead they they didn't do any of that they ran on nothing uh they're not getting rewarded and so you know what's the best case scenario now for them that they have kevin mccarthy a speaker who is even more uh, beholden to uh, the Marjorie Taylor Green wing of the party than than he was before. I don't know who comes well, out but ahead. Of that. Are are J D Vance and Kevin McCarthy not modern conservatives? Um, no, I think I would disagree with that. I mean, I I think that uh, I would say there are two different types of figures. I think Kevin McCarthy is the closest thing there is to a barometer of where Republican. Uh, the Republican Party is in Washington. I think he's like the guy who has to arbitrate between all the factions. I don't think McCarthy has any convictions or courage whatsoever. So I think where Kevin McCarthy is is kind of a sense of where the party is writ large. In terms of J.D. Vance, I mean, he ran a, a very ideological um, campaign, which is part of why he barely won the primary. And I expect him to be kind of the Trumpism without Trump figure in Washington. Um, and so in that sense, I mean, it's kind of a, it's a real victory for that wing of the party to have a sitting senator. Like I, that I disagree with you so completely on that assessment. Like, I don't think in my life I've ever disagreed with you more about anything. Like, like the, even that, is the dress gold or is it blue? Like uh, this dress is thoroughly, thoroughly gold. Um, uh, okay. What, why is that? Which part of it, first of all? 
I, like JD Van JD Vance was like a hardcore MAGA psycho for a couple months to win a Republican primary. He's an MSNBC pundit. He's a venture capitalist. He's in a biracial marriage. He has cute kids that are you know multiracial and talks about it. He um like if you watched him in his debates, like he wasn't some Marjorie Taylor Green, Lauren Boebert idiot. Like JV Vance knows the game he's playing. He's a conservative. He's he he he's just he's just wearing, you know, a Trump colored cloak to get through a primary. I don't I, I don't buy that at all. Oh yeah, no, I, I disagree pretty strongly. I mean I've I've seen the story probably a thousand times in Republican circles. It's like the you know, the, the white guy from a non-coastal part of the country makes it to an, an elite school and doesn't fit in and gets totally aggrieved. And like they they play the game to get ahead in their career, but they're just totally aggrieved. And uh, the real them is like the resentful, angry side that now has an outlet for it. I mean, you know, by I, I think I expect. Bro, it's like you're describing to... me. <laughs> can, can, Kentucky boy at, in the, on the anyway, I'll shut up. Yeah, well, well, look, I mean, it, you know, this is why Josh Hawley is how he is now, right? I mean, people say, oh, what changed about Josh Hawley? I don't think anything changed. I think what changed is that he didn't have to grub his way to the top anymore, and he's now free to sort of uh, be who he is. And I think I expect, uh, I, let me put it this way. I think the J.D. Vance that's about to come is going to be much closer to who he is in real life than the one who was in uh, Silicon Valley um, uh, writing Hillbilly Elegy or whatever. All right, so mixed, mixed, mixed bag for conservatism. We're gonna have to agree to disagree on that. Um, do you want to take? And, and I by think the it... way, I mean, I'll, I'll just, uh, well, I'll just say one more thing too. I mean, as of this recording, you know, you, you have a left wing Twitter kind of uh, gleefully saying Lo Lauren Boebert uh, might lose. I don't. I think she's gonna probably win. Marjorie Taylor Greene's gonna win. So that whole nut bag wing of the Republican Party, I think, is stronger than ever in, in some ways. All right, so I think you need to uh, take the first pitch on this one. So I think we owe a projection on political gambling. Um, are we, in fact, headed into a new dark age for uh, betting in the United States? Um, yeah, look, I, I think, um, well, you and I were talking uh, uh, offline before, like the uh, the day after the election may go down in retrospect is like literally the worst day ever for political gambling i mean truly black wednesday yeah so um well okay there's a lot to say here i mean we covered ftx which uh i mean the, the tentacles of that go pretty far uh, as as you mentioned um you know but even beyond that i mean so uh, i was at uh an event in in New York where all the CFTC commissioners were speaking, and uh, Chairman Benham actually got a question directly about political prediction markets, and uh, it was very funny to see his body language. I mean, he's a guy who likes engaging on these panels and talking and stuff. As soon as that question came up, like his whole body language changed. He just like really clearly was exasperated and didn't want to talk about it. And he basically made clear that he thinks Congress has given sufficient guidance and he alluded to precedent, which I think is probably a reference to Nadex. So I took from that that he is pretty determined not to give the go ahead here. And then so you're thinking about, OK, now that the CFTC basically is making clear they're not going to give Kalashi approval uh, and they're not looking all too favorably on these, uh, what, if anything, might change the equation? I mean, if the if the entire argument is that these markets have academic value and they're really going to disrupt a broken polling industry and all that, I mean, talk about blowing it. You look at the predicted prices on the eve of the election. If you had taken those to the bank, I mean, you really were going to be misguided about where this election was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the like the prediction markets basically universally assumed that polls were fake and stupid and wrong. Uh, and and probably doubled down on that mistake by thinking the only polls worth listening to were like Trafalgar polls, which were clearly stupid and wrong and maybe possibly fake to this cycle. So uh, really, really brutal cycle for political gambling, uh, both in social utility and legal standing. Uh, I hate to say it, but I think we are headed into a new dark age. Um, I want to do one more exercise on this. I want to... Um, I'm not sure where I come down on this, but I want to talk about Mitch McConnell, who's escaped a little bit of criticism. 
Um, but I want to talk about the narrative of Mitch McConnell, political genius. Um, I'm going to say no one will throw this take out except for me, but I'm going to say New Dark Age. And the the reason why is I think he was very smart. You know, if you look back on this cycle, he kind of took the attitude of I'm going to just go chill at the bar while these fucking idiots try and get elected once he saw who the primaries picked. So uh, a stroke of political genius in that sense. But I do think that his argument with Rick Scott that ultimately Rick Scott was somewhat vindicated uh, because that argument, if you remember it in the press, Rick Scott put out like a policy platform that had some things that people didn't like and were probably going to be unpopular. But Rick Scott basically said, we have to sell the voters something. It's not enough to just be against Joe Biden. And Mitch McConnell said, oh, buddy, it is plenty to be against Joe Biden. And clearly it was not enough to be against Joe Biden. So um, I'm going to say that we're in a, a, a darkening age for the um, unfailing genius of Mitch McConnell and political strategy. Do you want to take that? I mean, I, I have never bought into this myth of Mitch McConnell as political genius in the first place. I mean, you look at, first of all, his career before Senate Majority Leader. I mean, I challenge anyone to think of a single Republican fiasco over the last 20 years where Mitch McConnell was not an enabler. And then you look at the time that he's been the Speaker, I mean, uh, or the Senate Majority Leader. I mean, the, the fundamental fact of life about politics that Mitch McConnell, I think, does not grasp is that losing an election actually is not the worst thing in the world if you, you you know what what really matters is whether or not you you have a referendum to do the things you want to or not and i think that where where rick scott i think understood this point and mcconnell didn't is that if you lose an election right you you may as well lose it in a way that you're actually going to bat for ideas and changing the discourse and then likewise i mean there is a time and place to spend political capital, and and the time to do that is so that you can lay the groundwork for a better election cycle. I mean, I think Mitch McConnell has failed very catastrophically in two respects. I think the first is, after January 6th, if there was ever a moment where the party could have really rid itself of the Trump problem once and for all, I think it would have been if McConnell had really used his political capital with his own caucus to try to get a conviction for Trump. He didn't do that. And then instead, what he tried to do is exactly what you said, think that just being an opposition party uh, was going to be enough in the cycle. The problem is that doesn't work when you're giving Trump free reign to basically pick a bunch of unelectable people in the primaries. And then on top of that, uh, not only not run, an, uh, run on an agenda, but leave the vacuum open to the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the QAnon wing of the party. I think the the Republicans more or less got uh, what they deserve, and things could get even worse if they don't take the House. <sighs> Ooh. Tough crowd for Cocaine Mitch today. Uh, Mitch McConnell, political genius, headed into a new dark age. Um, do you have anything else, or do you want to... I, I mean, yeah, well, I want to say one more thing on this political genius trope. I mean, have you noticed how, like, every cycle, the media is quick to claim, like, some political genius who in fact is a dud like for a while it was steve bannon for a while it was carl rove like they always the media always finds like this one republican who they don't like and deem him to be like this evil genius this guy pulling the strings and inevitably like the only political genius thing about these people is that like they spend a little bit more time backgrounding uh left-wing elite media than their other colleagues but it's just like a really stupid trope and it's never actually really true New Dark Age, Cocaine Mitch. Um, do you have any more of these, or um, should I just deem my personal life a New Dark Age uh, now that the bottom is falling out from under political gambling, but we love this podcast and the boys? Um, so I have one uh, for you. Okay. Um, which I've been thinking about. So uh, what do you think of wave elections? <sighs> Um, what do I think about wave elections? I think political terminology about wave elections, like we are thoroughly bombed back into the stone age of that. If I hear another dumb thing about like ripples and waves and tsunamis, I'm going to literally rip my eyeballs out and put them in an envelope and mail them to Chuck Todd. Um, uh, I, what's interesting about wave elections is, is that obviously we didn't have one, but the amount of people who are voting these days, um, seems like a wave of its own. I mean, it just seems like turnout has been so high in so many consecutive elections that there's some sort of wave to get back into the bad wave terminology. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm going to say born again, but under a new definition. 
Yeah, I mean, the reason I was thinking about that is we've now had basically two cycles where there was a conventional wisdom that there would be a wave election. This time around, the idea was that the Republicans would have a wave. Last time around, it was that the Democrats would. And both times, I mean, you just kind of had gridlocked politics where both sides were holding their own. Um, you know, like Flip Pideau was talking about something like a 2014 wave uh, recurring Um even in 2018, this Democratic wave, Republicans managed to gain in the Senate. And so I wonder, I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm thinking that have we reached a point where the two parties have just gone so deep on identity politics and where the American people are just kind of voting their identity that no matter how good or bad a governing party is, if we're just going to kind of see gridlocked elections going forward? Yes, but no. And um, we wrote about this on the Star Spangled Gamblers blog. I, I mean, like nothing changes overnight, but it, it seems like just based on the amount of ticket splitting that came in this election, that there is an influential minority of people who want to be persuaded that their vote is worth more than just what party it goes to. And um, if that's a trend, I think that portends that actually the phenomenon you're describing will be rid of us at, at some point in the foreseeable future. Yeah, and I guess what I'll say, too, is, I mean, imagine a counterfactual, which we came pretty close to, where, like, David McCormick was the Republican nominee yeah. in Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, you, you had a few different Republican nominees. I mean, if the Republicans had even taken the Senate by 51-49 margin, and even if they had taken the House, um, you know, I, I know that Republicans set expectations very high, but even that scenario, I think, would have constituted a uh, a wave so to speak right, right so a lot of this is, is like people drawing narratives from things that could very easily have gone a different way uh, with a couple of different events uh new dark new dark age for hydroponic metaphors um i don't want to really talk about it but i think we should also say that polls are born again congratulations to pollsters for getting it right after a few cycles of just having egg dripping off your face in a humiliating way um, and then, um, any, anything before we kind of get to the credit section? I mean, this is kind of our like season finale here. So, um, I, I think we are close to having talked to death, but anything else you want to nominate before we say goodbye? Um, well, I have a whole list of, um, things I've been nominations I've been saving for golden Medellas so we can get into, you know, that, uh, you know, here. I think we could, I think you're right. I think that the speculation for the golden Modellos is really heating up right now. Um, you know, I'll throw out some traders names. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I just don't think anyone could look at the year that Zelby Badger had had, like he had a great rookie season last cycle, but at this point he just seems like he's absolutely on top of his game. I think uh, Wine Mom really been turning in some impressive numbers and some great shit posting. Uh, Pee Pee Poo Poo just some great shit posting. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it is time for the Golden Modella speculations to begin. But I, I, I you know, that's also a, a separate podcast too. What do you, What do you think? Yeah, so I want to save some of those nominees for later. But there is one person I want to uh, call out and really thank uh, in particular. Yeah. Um, which is predict it. Uh, I, I have not been shy about criticizing them, and uh, I'm going to continue to heap uh, uh, scorn on them in the coming months if they keep up their political strategy. But with that said, I mean, a lot of people were really expecting their site to tank again, and they have every reason not to be investing in uh, good infrastructure given the political landscape. But um, I think the website held up really well on election night. There were only a couple of moments here and there when the site slowed down. Um, but I just want to congratulate the predicted team for um, really delivering on the technology side uh, this election. And they also threw a nice uh, election day party, actually. I showed up a bit late to it, but um, uh, it seemed like a good event. So uh, I think they're, uh, even if their market prices weren't great, I think in terms of the site quality, uh, definitely a pleasant surprise. Well, um, you know what, Pratik, let's just take that road. Um, I think it's time to tap the brakes and head towards the off ramp. Um, we owe just a lot of people thank yous for this season of politics. I think you were right to thank Predict It's team up top. I will do it first and foremost again. John Phillips, uh, Brandy, Lindsay, and the team, uh, thank you for a great election. Uh, of course, uh, Shane at Polymarket, Tark and Luana at Kalshi, all of these people who provide these markets could be doing anything with their lives, but they're doing this. 
and um, you know, sometimes publicly and sometimes behind the scenes, we disagree with them and you know have our opinions. But the truth is, is that um, we are at the end of the day um, very thankful for each and every one of these people who makes this possible. Um, I want to thank uh, you, Pratik, first of all, for um, your tireless advocacy. Um, I said earlier that it's been a bad season for alpha males. Um, I don't know if you consider yourself an alpha male or a beta male, but I act like an alpha male on this podcast, and you've just really been delivering so much value for our users, um, especially these past few months as you've been tracking the CFTC. And I also want to thank uh, the 50 or so people who fund this podcast. Thank you. Um, if you want to support it, go to starspangledgamblers.com slash support. Um, it is an incredible amount of effort that it takes to produce this podcast, but we do it because we love it. I want to thank uh, our editors, Sebastian and Rennie. And anyone who came on the Star Spangled Cup po Gamblers podcast this cycle, it takes a lot of guts to bet on politics. It takes even more to bear your predictions in the sunlight, which can be scorching as time goes on. So um, thank you to everyone. Uh, uh, my heart uh, swells as I think of what you've done for us. You want to add anything to the list? Uh, I, Yeah, yeah. I want to add uh, a few more uh, to the list. And, and I want to second everyone you mentioned there. I want to say... Um, in terms of uh, election betting providers, um, Doug Campbell and Insight Prediction, I think they uh, have entered the scene. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and I also want to say, too, you know, I think one of the breakthroughs that we made as a community this cycle is that um, in the past, I would say in the press reporting on uh, in this area, you know, there's been like the occasional human interest story of like, oh, look at those guys, they're betting on politics, how funny and interesting. But I think that we got something of a breakthrough in the sense that when you look at the quality of journalism and reporting on our community, I think it went beyond those human interest stories where really people made an effort to look seriously at the expertise we have to bring to the table. Um, and uh, and I think that there were breakthroughs, number one, in you know just taking us seriously as people with wisdom that could complement or compete with election pundits and polls. And there are a number of journalists I think we could really thank here. And then also in the context of what has been happening with the political gambling industry, with Kalashi and Predicted and so forth, I think many of the journalists who are covering this area, um, Lydia Bayoud from Bloomberg comes to mind, but there, there are many others. Um, I think they really saw that our community is deep in the weeds of this and we know what's going on. And uh, a lot of them came to us for comments and sourcing. And so, um, you know, I think there may be some dark times ahead, but I also think that um, the infrastructure and community that has been built here is not just going to go away overnight and uh, how it will evolve and morph will, it will be uh, determined. But in that sense, I'm very optimistic about the community that I think we have uh, been a part of, and I think it's going to continue to be a force in American politics. All right. So uh, I think that's it. I think that's a wrap on election 2022. That is the season finale, boys. Um, I'm not going to call it the series finale. We'll be back. Uh, we'll have to find new and more creative ways to uh, talk about what we do and love here. So um, on behalf of Star Spangled Gamblers and all of the uh, people who we owe a great deal of credit to, um, thank you for sticking with us this election, and we will see you soon.